Hello and welcome to Books and Beyond. I'm Jimmy Bennett, your host. And today we have a very special show. Um, my guest, I have two guests today actually. One, Amby Burfoot, uh, the local legend, the runner. And Kale Kislevitz, uh, another runner and an author. Um, today they co-wrote a book or co-edited a book called uh, The Book of Kel, which we'll get to in a little bit. But uh, as though everybody knows Amby, I want to just introduce him and let him tell you a little bit about what he's been up to and what he does and uh, talk a little bit about his career. Hello, Amby. How are you? I'm very good, and thank you for the invitation today. It's really fun to, to be here. So uh, I grew up at Groton Long Point and Mystic. Actually, my father was the first director of what's now known as the Mystic YMCA way oh, back in the 50s. So I'm a native boy. I went away and had a career working for Runner's World magazine in Pennsylvania for about 20 years. But I've been back in Mystic for seven or eight years now, running the old roads and, and enjoying the lovely shoreline life. So uh, I'm 74 now, still running. I'll probably run the Boston Marathon in October this year and working on various running projects. I've done several books with Gail, which has been a terrific uh, experience, and I'm working on some more stuff for the future. That's great. You won in 1959? 68. No, 68. You 68. won in 68. It was John won in 1959. He won in 57. 57. I won in 68, and it was only 68. foreigners between us. We were the direct link for American winners, and then Bill Rogers oh, started wow. 53 winning a years lot. ago, and you're going to run again this year. That's incredible. Run again this year. That is that Looking is forward to fantastic. It. Um, I'm sorry. You know what it was? It was the Pan Am Games. That's right. Because I just know because I was born in 1959, <laughs> so I was like, wow. I didn't realize that John had won that, you know, back then. Anyways, more about you. Let's. I want to. I want to let people know what you've been up to. Um. Well, I'm doing a lot of the things I've done for many, many years: running, writing, editing, researching, enjoying life. Uh, I. It's been great to come back and be part of the running community here. That uh, I left 20 years ago to go to Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a wonderful running community. It's very vibrant. Uh, we've got a Kelly statue in downtown Mystic. We've Thanks. got a Kelly store in Old Mystic Village. Yeah. And so these are real focal points that all of us enjoy engaging around and being part of. Uh, Kelly's very, very much an endearing memory here in Mystic. Yeah, as it, you know, he was a teacher at Fish Senior High School, too, for many years. So um, that's where I had first come across him and met him. I, I actually, I told you, my, uh, my wife's family grew up next door to the Kellys, so uh, they were always very close, uh, the girls and the, and, the, and the parents, so it's, uh, it's nice, you know, he, he's just such a local legend, um, well, I think you probably edge him out just a little bit in the local legend division, but... Uh, not really, but what's interesting about the house on Pequot Avenue was there was an un ceasing line of misfits in and out of that house for yeah. so many years because John and Jesse were home to runners, to artists, to folk singers, to disgruntled uh, misfits and all sorts of people. We all rallied around him because he was such a uh, revolutionary himself. Right. Um, well, we have a few pictures. Uh, let's uh, like the show and let's, talk about them. Let's see what we've got. So there I am winning the Boston Marathon in 1968. You can see it's a sunny day with the strong shadow out in front of me. I collapsed like a wet noodle a moment later, but it's a very, very cherished memory that I have. Um, was the crowds as big back then as they are now? The crowds were just as big then as they, were they are really? now, especially on a warm day like this. And they were all drunken Boston uh, yeah. <laughs> students on Patriots Day. <laughs> And there was absolutely no traffic control. Here at the finish, you see traffic control. Out on the streets, there was none. And to run through the roads of downtown Boston, it was literally closed in front of me, and they opened up to let me through, and then closed in back of me because there were no police. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
And there's John Kelly congratulating me in the locker room about a half an hour later. He actually ran the same race. He was still running strong that year. He finished about 20th or so. And after I won the race, I didn't care about the medal draped around my neck. I didn't care about the laurel wreath. All I cared about was waiting for my coach and mentor, John Kelly, to finish so that I could share the good news with him. Nice. That was the most important thing. And here I am running a marathon with Oprah Winfrey. This was in 1993 or 94 at the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. You can see that the guys in red, the National Enquirer, uh, they had her staked out because they wanted her to drop out so they could publish embarrassing photos of her. But o Oprah, despite the sloppy conditions, uh, actually finished the race in about four and a half hours. It was a very, very courageous run because there was so much attention on her. And at one point, the guys from the Enquirer told her that I was running behind her and that I had won the Boston Marathon. And at that point, she turned around and waved me forward and stuck, stuck out her hand. And we had this moment of shaking hands. And later, the Enquirer people, who had photographers everywhere, sent me this photo. Wow. That's great. Um, I didn't realize that. So John, John was your coach and mentor? John was a coach at uh, Fitch High to all of us. We all oh, started okay. cross-country running at uh, Fitch. And after I graduated from Fitch and started thinking about longer distances like the marathon, he was my mentor, my inspiration. He was everything to me. Have you always been a marathoner? Well, nobody's always a marathoner. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was a marathoner. So I ran my first marathon when I was 18, which was pretty young then. Wow. And there was only one reason why I did it, and that was because I wanted to follow in the footsteps of John Kelly. Wow. That's great. So, Gail, Gail, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow. I um, have spent every summer of my life in New London, Connecticut on the beach where my family has had a house for over 100 years. Oh, nice. Um, and I always wanted to run. I watched my older brothers run track in high school, but at that time, girls weren't allowed to run. I mean, a lot, they weren't allowed to join a team. There were no women's team. Uh, women just weren't told to run that we could run. Uh, so I took offense to that. And one night when I was 16 years old, I put on my keds and took the family dog and ran around the block and and I never stopped. I came back transformed like this is what I wanted to do. Um, ironically that was the same year 1967 that Catherine Switzer uh, undercover ran the Boston Marathon and was almost thrown off the course for the uh, crime of being female. Right. So um, I just embraced running and I've run 27 marathons and Running gave me my career. I worked at Runner's World for 20 years. Well, not, not 20 years, but I had my own column at Runner's World. And um, I've run, written seven books on running, and I had almost 20 years with New York Road Runners, uh, some of it as a marathon coach. Oh. So running is a huge part of my life and has brought me great, great joy. Great. Well, we have some pictures, too. Um, yeah. We have, put I them think, up. Um, so I think the first picture is going to be when I won my, uh, well, not won, but I earned my Abbott World Major Marathon medal. It's that huge medal there in the middle. So if you run um, six of the world's major marathons, which would be New York, Chicago, um, Boston, Berlin, uh, what am I missing? London. Tokyo and London, you get this badass medal wow. and I got mine in Tokyo in 2019 right before you know pretty much right before the world right. stopped yeah. Yeah. so it was a great great memory it was a cold freezing windy rainy 30 degree day in Tokyo um, but you know when we talk about the running community here I am in in Asia I don't speak a, a lick of Japanese and yet here we are at the starting line and I'm looking around at all, all the runners next to me, and we all have a conversation, just nodding and pointing and a few words of the rain, you know, what kind of shoes you're wearing. And it just, it was just so wonderful to be part of that and experience that. So I was very proud of that day. It was, yeah. it was really a, 
a monumental well, That's quite finish. an achievement. Wow. I yeah. Mean, I mean, if you got the time and the money and, and you can get around to these places, anyone yeah, yeah. can get it. You know, it's not like you have to be fast. Yeah. But it was great. It was, it was a wonderful achievement. Good. And then um, that is finishing the 2014 Boston Marathon, which still, every time I talk about that, I just get the chills. Um, it, was, it was the year after the bombing. Oh. So Boston came out in full force in every step of that race course. The fans were thanking us, I'm gonna get choked up, thanking us for coming back right to this city and giving them back our race yep and so it was just one of the most memorable runs i've ever done and the funny thing is that ha when i was halfway at maybe 13 miles the word trickled back that meb had won the marathon oh. and we just exploded we were dancing in the street i mean just just to have that the apple on top of yeah. that race was was a great day. That's it was a great day for everybody. So yeah, that was that was huge. All right, you know, before we get to the book of Kel, there's one thing I wanted to just talk about a little bit because I I guess I didn't really ever comprehend it, is the business of running. Hmm. I mean, I didn't realize it's a big business. It, that what a big <laughs> yeah. business it really was. Um, and one of the things that um, interested me and that I, I think people should know, you know, so maybe they could help out was um, I was reading one of your blogs, and it was about how they finance runners so they can train. You know, you don't think about that, you know, but uh, there's all kinds of things that they do, right? There's sponsorships and stuff like that that people can do, and then... Well, now running is big business, uh, and it's worldwide. It's a global big business, so everybody knows the shoe brands, whether they know Nike and Adidas and whatnot. But the spinoff goes on from there to the apparel, and all the food companies now want to advertise that their food is nutrition nutritional, and the way you do that is by having an active runner as your sponsor or your spokesperson. It's a complete and utterly different world than the world that John Kelly lived in. When I was an athlete, uh, varsity letterman at Fitch High, we got a certificate every year, the same certificate every Fitch athlete got, and down the bottom, your coach signed it, said coach, John J. Kelly. John Kelly put it in his typewriter, I watched him do this, X'd out the word coach, because the word coach used to be a bad word. It inferred or it implied professionalism. And if you were a professional coach, you could be barred from the Olympics. And that was actually his fear. Even though he was nothing but an unpaid coach and English teacher at Fitch, he didn't want to see the word coach next to his name. So he crossed it off and put advisor, John J. Kelly. Um, I wish I still had that yeah. letter certificate. Mm -hmm. I have the memory. So it was, it was a sin. It was a mortal sin to make a dollar from running in the 1950s when Kelly was the best in the country for a full full decade. So he never got a thing from this sport. Now people do, and, and that's wonderful. Would have been nice if someone like John Kelly could have made a few dollars too. But I think in, running has become a big business, um, and there is a lot of money out there. But I think even you would agree, most of that money does not trickle down to the runner. It stays in corporations, it stays in Nike, it stays in apparel. If you're really good, you'll get sponsorship. But if you're not, you know, you're, you're kind of on your own. That's how I think. Well, it trickles down to the Boston Marathon winners. Not that True. Kelly got it, not that right. I got it, but today but the a, Boston Marathon winners a few. win prize money right. and shoe contracts, and it goes on from there. Oh, okay. Uh, you, well, I, just, I guess I just thought it was interesting, like, like you say, if you were a young man, you know, in high school or, or just starting off in college, and you wanted to, like, train for the Olympics, I mean, that's a lot of dedication. That's a lot of time. You know what I mean? And you need, that, that's got to be a when lot I, of when money. I, when I look back at the training I did and the training Kelly did, it makes absolutely no logical sense whatsoever. Why the hell would you train 20 miles a day, two or three hours a day, fatiguing yourself to the end for nothing? I mean, we, got, we literally got nothing, and yet we were imbued with this spirit of wanting to see how much we could develop as athletes. And the marathon was this worldwide significant, because of the Olympics, 
significant event that had a finish line at 26 miles, 20, 0.22 miles, 26 miles, 385 yards. And every one of us trained our butts off to see how far fast we could get from the start to the 26.385 mark. Uh, but we didn't get any reward when we got there. I mean, right. I've got a little medal and I've got the wreath, yeah. uh, and I suppose the medal has some chili. value. But uh, there was no check that got handed to me over the table, under the table, or do you think now? Do you think way. now it's uh, more prestigious, maybe the way I want to put it, to win the Boston Marathon than it was back in 1968? No, it's less prestigious because in 1968 there was only the Olympics in Boston, and now there are all of these right. other marathons. And some of them have a lot of money. And you've got new races coming up that we've never heard of in the familiar places like India and China and the Middle East with unbelievable budgets. And they, they literally buy the fastest runners and fly them in. They pay right. them before the race. They pay them after the race because they want the prestige. So um, there's so much more out there yet. It's Boston will always be Boston. The Olympics will always be the Olympics. But now there's so much more out there that it kind of muddies the water quite a bit. Right. Because you don't have to be a, you can be a professional and still compete in the Olympics now. Absolutely. Right? Right? Which the, is, and everyone which is, is a professional. A big, right. Which is a big difference than, right. than it was. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. But I think that, you know, a kid coming out of high school who's a really good runner, if they think they're going to make a career and make a lot of money out of running, they're going to have to put a lot of time in. Yeah. Well, that's why, I mean, you still have to live, though. You have to support yourself. Yeah. You have to, you know. Um, so I, I was kind of wondering, you know, that's, I never really thought about the financial end of it. You know what I mean? You know, you just think, you strap on your sneakers, you put on your shorts, and out the door you go. You well, know? that's what most of us you do. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's, you know, um, but it's, it's, if you want to compete on a big level, it's, um, unfortunately, I mean, it's the way it is now. I mean, you need the money, you need the sponsorship, yeah. you need the... Um, the thing to do it. Um, I, I can tell you, and it saddens me to, to say this, that in the 50s when Kelly was the best in the country, went to two Olympics as well as winning Boston, he heard to his face and undercurrents not to his face, you idiot, John, why are you wasting your time running? Why don't you get another job so you can support your wife and your three kids better? And, you know, and because, you know, we all could use a little bit more money, we all could use the family support, uh, but he chose to put it all into the thing that he really loved, which was seeking excellence in his chosen right. sport. Well, uh, like you say, Rick, it's only been 155 winners. And he was one of them, and you were yeah. one of them. Right. I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty impressive, you know, for the time. You know? sure. Most people spend their lives just qualifying for Boston. Right. You know, forget yeah. winning it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. You have to qualify for that, too, right? You have to... You do. Uh, I mean, you could do a you know, charity spot, but... You do have to qualify with a certain time. I do want to get to the book, but real quick, yeah. I wanted to go over one more thing with the uh, about the running. Um, as you know, with the p pandemic, you know, so many of the races got canceled. Um, and but they talk about virtual races now. For a guy like me who knows nothing about it, w w how do you run a virtual race? I mean, how is that? <laughs> well, it's, it's like how you do a Zoom conference call uh, that we didn't know anything about a year ago. A virtual race means that you can't go to Hopkinton and run to Boston today, which is Boston Marathon Day, because the state and the country haven't reached that point of uh, pandemic uh, closure yet. But the Boston Marathon will be happy to take your money and send you a medal and a shirt if you want to run 26 miles around your house somewhere today. So you can do it anywhere. So that's, that's how it's virtual. And nowadays, everybody runs with a gizmo on their watch that uploads to the internet, oh. except for me. I don't have one of <laughs> yeah. those. But, uh, and that actually tracks the fact that you did run 26.2 miles. So you can, you can sort of prove that you ran the race. Right. Uh, and there's no money involved, so it doesn't matter <laughs> really whether you right. did or not. And you're usually but, given a couple of days to do yes, it. That's you the don't other have to do it on good. the day. You have sometimes up to a week. To, to run wherever you want. So you run, you post your time, you send your time in, and then they yeah, just correlate all the times and, yeah. and put it together, and you know? Exactly. Um, do you have any running groups around here that you're involved in now? 
We, we run with different groups. Uh, there are fun runs all over the, the place. A lot of them are supported by little restaurants that give you a beer afterwards, so that's yeah, fun. It's all and right. again, we haven't, done any, yeah. we haven't done any of this in the last year. The running right. community has been very uh, conservative and appropriate in following pandemic guidelines. But um, there are Ke the Kelly's Pace Running Store organizes training groups and puts on a few races. There are running clubs in the area in Norwich and around that also organize events. Uh, there's no difficulty for anyone to find a, a running event to be part of now. Uh, this, and in addition to that, a lot of us enjoy running by ourselves sometimes. And we all have friends who run. So you get together, as Gail and I do, with a few of your friends and just enjoy a nice hour or two together. What do you, uh, what do you, I mean, do you, do you like doing both? I mean, or would you prefer to run by yourself, or do you prefer to run with somebody? I've always run by myself. Um, the only time I ran with a group is I joined a club when I wanted to get faster. So most clubs offer speed workouts and coached running, and if you want to get faster, that's a great way to do it because it's all speed workout and you're running with a group of people, which always puts a little bit more competition into it and makes it more competitive. And I wouldn't do that on my own. Of course, when I run with Ambie, I always run faster. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you want to join a group, one, it's great camaraderie. And if you do want to have goals and get faster, uh, a running group will help you do that. Good. All right. So let's talk about the Book of Kel. Um, I was really excited to see this. Uh, a friend of mine uh, told me about it. Um, and I just think it's great. How, how did the book come about? I would say the book came about because for about a decade, people had been begging me to write a book about John. And I kept saying, listen, um, I don't want to do it alone. He doesn't belong to me, and I don't know any more about John than anyone else. I may have run more miles with him, but it should be more of a community effort. And finally, a year or two ago, I had some time on my schedule to reach out to Gail, who was a huge assist because of her energy and knowledge and a friendship with John, and also to others in the local community and say, how about you write this chapter and you write this chapter and you write this chapter. Uh, we obtained one chapter that originally appeared in Sports Illustrated 50 years ago. Everybody we asked said yes. They're not all writers, and writing isn't much fun for non-writers, but everybody did it, everybody contributed, and as a result, while there are four or five stories that in here that I wrote about John, there are that many that Gail wrote. Uh, we've got seven or eight or ten of his own essays and stories, and we have pieces from the entire community, including his daughters. We have an interview with the daughters, which is terrific. We have an interview with the fellow who now owns Kelly's Pace and tries to keep his memory uh, alive. And so it was really a community effort, and I think that's what makes it so special and so appropriate for the person that John was. Yeah, the fact that it was a collaborative effort and everyone that contributed to this book had a tie into John and loved John, and you can you get that feeling when you read the book. I, You know, I, I always... Um, one thing I always admired about um, John was that he did march to the beat of a different drummer. He was his, his own. own man. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was just... He, he, didn't seem to be caught up with many things, you know. Oh, well, Andy, you going to read us a little part? Well, since you gave the introduction to what I was yeah. hoping to read, and this will just take a couple of minutes, uh, to set the, the scenery, this is what is from a time when I'm about 20 years old. And John is my coach and the guy I look up to more than anyone in the world. And he's won the Boston Marathon. He's been to two Olympics. I'm a skinny 20-year-old guy who wants to be like him. So every day I say, how do I do it? How do I do it? What are the lessons, et cetera? And this is what I wrote about it. Now and again, I wanted more from Kelly than he was willing to deliver. As I improved and raised my sights, I naturally asked him what it would take to win the Boston Marathon or to make the Olympics. He never answered, at least not with the magical training plan or secret endurance building diet I assumed was the necessary ingredient. Kelly disdained gurus, prophets, cults, religions, bureaucrats, self-assigned experts, and all purveyors of pablum, bromides, and snake oil. On occasion, he left me feeling more adrift than I wanted. 
Nonetheless, Kelly was always there when I needed him. We talked endlessly. Well, he talked. I listened. And it seemed that we ran a million miles together. Many years later, I realized, of course, that he had given me more than a recipe for success. He had given me himself, and he had also set me free. So he didn't want to be a guru. He was, the, he was entirely anti-guru. And to some of us, that made him larger than life. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I once asked John um, what he saw in Ambi, because they had such a special connection. And he told me that um, it was the first meet that you had gone to. And they didn't do well. So they're on the bus coming home. And you know John does what he does. He walks around the bus. And he's telling everyone, don't worry. You know, Next time, we'll do better. And he gets to Ambi. And he says, you know, don't worry. You did well. We'll do better. And he said, Ambi looked at me. And he said, oh, I know we will. And he said, there was something in the tone of his voice and the look in his eyes. I knew that guy was going places. Yeah. He, he, he recalled it like it just happened. Uh, he, was a, he was a very special man. Um, and it was, I was really, I, I mean, I think it's just wonderful the statue they put up of him, Mystic. Yeah, um, and that, the, how and, that came about is all And Brutus the, the dog. I mean, and the dog. Uh, we had to have, have a Brutus dog there. Because um, I did, used to see them running constantly, you know, everywhere. And I Usually on, that, off leash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yes. I hope that people, uh, you know, especially with all the people in this area now, I mean, we're growing and growing and growing. Um, you know, those of us that actually knew John Kelly in one way or another, um, but there's a, he's such a great story and such a larger-than-life, you know, personality. Um, I, th I just think it's wonderful you wrote this book. It gives people a chance to, uh, to you know, get to know mm -hmm. him a little bit more, get to know a little bit. More. I mean, I've learned. It's so funny. I mean, I, I, you know, I've seen him so many times and saw him running and no, you know, we just, it's a small town. So yeah. I know a lot of people that know him and, you know, and uh, all the stories and everything else. But I'm learning so many different things. Well, um, I think it's a, it's a tribute to him and the statue that any time you go down to Mystic and you pass that statue, somebody's sitting there or reading the plaque or they've put a T-shirt on I love him. it. I love the new T-shirt on every yeah. time you go by. I don't know who does that. but uh, So it's, it's uh, keeping his legend alive yeah. and um, yep. the fact of how beloved he was. Yep. So let me know. Uh, we're running out of time quickly here. So let me know. Tell us where we can find the book. The book is on Amazon, so okay. you can find it there, The Book of Kel. It's probably at Kelly's Pace Running Store if he's able to keep up with it. And I'm not sure about the bookstore downtown, but Kelly's Pace and Amazon. And we should make sure that we mention that Jim Roy was the person responsible for getting the statue together. Yes. It took him years yes. of effort. He loved Kelly as mm -hmm. much yep. as any of us, if not more, yeah. and he single-handedly Spearheaded the the drive to get that make that. Yeah, story. yeah, and that's a fascinating story. Yeah, that that I I was almost thinking at some point or another I'd like to almost have him on and uh, and uh, you know tell us that story because it is He's it's got a great pretty story. incredible what he did. Um, I've known Jim you know since we were kids. Sure. And, uh, um, it, that was really a wonderful you know wonderful tribute to him. Yeah. Um, my sweet. wife says uh, the one thing she remembers is the Sunday afternoons after the run was the party over at the Kelly's house every Sunday afternoon. After the Kelly road race. After the Kelly, you know, I guess they used to run every Sunday morning for a long time. Every like, Sunday we, morning, that's yeah. what it was, Gail. It was yeah. just oh. anybody and everybody could show yeah, up anybody, and run yeah. with Kelly. Yep. And really, I, you know, I was young. I didn't understand family economics. We must have bankrupted him and Jess <laughs> several times over with the cookies and teas and yep. things that we ate afterwards at his house. But yep. it was a... It was uh, an all-in, all-together celebration with the Kellys. Yeah, he was welcoming everybody, and yeah, it was uh, it was it was really a, a it was well one of them local uh, legends, one of those local things that you know everybody. And he knew loved about, everyone you know? who walked into that door. Yeah, he didn't. He, I, and as you left, he would grab you and say, "Don't, don't leave! leave. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. leave!" I've never I've never heard the man utter a bad word about anybody ever. Um, he was just you know he was just that kind of man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, maybe you'll have to come back again and we'll have to talk about all the other books and stuff that you've done. Anytime. Um, you know, 
see how we do in October. Well, you do in October. I'll be watching. Right. <laughs> so that's it for Books and Beyond today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.